Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to start by talking about escort fighters. The name here makes it pretty obvious what these planes are. They escort other, more vulnerable planes, whether it be bombers or cargo planes, or even planes carrying high-value targets, like an important general or political leader. Unlike your more standard fighter, the most important aspect for an escort fighter isn't to have speed or maneuverability necessarily, but rather range, because escort fighters typically escort larger aircraft that have much greater fuel capacities, they themselves had to have enough fuel to travel the full distance with the escortee. For example, if escorting bombers, they had to escort them out to the target area, fly around while the bombers drop their payloads, and escort them back home. With the escort fighters needing to have high fuel capacities, this placed them into a bit of a conundrum. Due to the need for having high fuel capacities, countries would typically use larger heavy fighters for escort missions. Having a higher fuel capacity typically means that the plane would be much bulkier, and as a result, much slower and less agile. This means that when enemy fighters would move to intercept, their much lighter, more agile standard fighters would be able to outmaneuver the defending heavy fighters and shoot them down. It should be said that this wasn't a universal truth, and planes like America's P-38 Lightning, despite their size, could hold their own against incoming enemy fighters. Still, for the United States, while the P-38 and P-51 fighters with external fuel tanks added would serve well as escort fighters, in 1943, an escort fighter with an even greater range was needed. The P-51's range, with external fuel tanks added, maxed out at around 1,600 miles, and for the U.S. mission to bomb the Japanese homeland from either the Philippines or the Solomon Islands, they would want something with a range over 2,000 miles. For this, the company North American Aviation would step up and would create this. This is the F-82 Twin Mustang. In October 1943, North American Aviation would begin design work on the requested Very Long Range Escort Fighter. Design work didn't really start from scratch, but rather as a derivative of the already successful P-51 fighters. A then-in-development lightweight variant of the P-51, then known as the XP-51F, was used as the overall base and was modified to fit the long-range role. Two of these fuselages would be connected by a central wing and twin tail section. To accommodate the need for greater fuel capacity, the fuselages would be lengthened by 57 inches and could be filled with extra fuel tanks or just storage space if needed. Because of the plane's planned range, in each of the fuselages the cockpit would be kept and maintained and would actually be manned in flight. On longer range flights, control could be taken by either pilot in either fuselage, so if one pilot got tired or needed a break, the other one could take the wheel. This gave the F-82 a rather distinct appearance of having two separate functional cockpits. The resulting final body design, having been based mainly on the P-51, was basically conjoined P-51s on steroids. It would measure in at 39 feet 5 inches long, 51 feet 3 inches wide, 11 feet 10 inches tall, and would weigh 16,000 pounds empty and nearly 26,000 pounds at full capacity. Armed with six 50 caliber machine guns in the center wing section, plans were made to develop weapon modifications for the F-82 in the form of removable weapon pods, a pod containing an additional eight 50 caliber machine guns, and a pod containing a 40 millimeter cannon were planned but were never fully developed. The F-82 would also be given hard points for carrying up to four 1,000-pound bombs, or later on, 25 5-inch rockets. Initially powered by two British Rolls-Royce V-1650 Merlin engines, engineers would design the propeller rotation so that they each spun in opposite directions. In this initial design, the port or left propeller would spin clockwise, and the starboard or right propeller would spin counterclockwise. In effect, this meant that they would sort of meet in the middle, spinning upwards. 
However, when this propeller arrangement was first tested, they discovered that the plane failed to take off at all. Going back to the drawing board to figure out why, it was found that this propeller arrangement effectively canceled out the lifting effect the central wing had. This basically made the central wing into dead weight. To fix this, the propeller rotations would be reversed. This would completely solve the issue, and on June 26, 1945, the F-82 would officially fly for the first time. Now, you may have noticed that this first flight of the F-82 is rather close to the end of World War II, and yes, the F-82 wouldn't actually be able to participate in World War II as intended. Additionally, early in production, the V-1650 engines would be swapped out for Allison V-1710 engines. This was both because of Britain increasing their licensing fees for the V-1650 after the war, and the Army wanting the F-82 to be powered by American-made engines. These new engines would have more horsepower, but were overall weaker than the Rolls-Royce engines. Thus, the full production run models actually performed worse than the initial prototype version. Still, it could fly up to 461 miles an hour, so the F-82 didn't suddenly become useless as a result. Once the F-82 finally entered production in the mid-1940s, the war was already over and aviation technology was moving far past the F-82. As the end of the war saw the beginnings of jet-powered aircraft with America, Britain, the Soviet Union, and the soon-to-be-dead Nazi Germany either researching or producing jet aircraft, the F-82, being a propeller-powered aircraft, basically made it obsolete as it rolled off the production line. Additionally, as the war was over now, countries began slowing down their military weapon production, and the original U.S. military order for 500 F-82s would never come to fruition. For the entirety of the F-82's production run, just over half that number at 272 would be made in total. So, knowing that the F-82 was already outdated and war production was winding down, it does raise the question of why production of it continued at all. As it turns out, production only continued on it because of delays in U.S. production of other jet fighters. A planned all-weather interceptor called the XF-87 Blackhawk, first ordered in December 1945, experienced severe production delays and issues that would actually end up killing the project by late 1948. In the meantime, though, until a new jet fighter could be made for this role, the F-82 would serve in its place. Additionally, as the development of a jet-powered night fighter, which would eventually be the F-89 Scorpion, was also delayed, the F-82 and the already in-service P-61 Black Widow would be selected to serve in that role as well. To fit the role of a night fighter, several modifications would be made to the F-82. For one, a large pod containing radar equipment would be housed under the central wing. To man that radar, the second pilot in the other cockpit would be replaced with a radar operator. Now, until modern jet fighters could be made, the F-82 would temporarily serve as a military combat plane, and for the first few years of its career, it didn't really have anything to do. As the U.S. was not engaged in any major conflict in the late 1940s, the F-82 would spend most of its career in training missions, simulated attacks, and just on the ground waiting to be flown in case of an attack. With the start of the Korean War in mid-1950 and with U.S. production of jet fighters happening, but in smaller numbers than needed, the F-82 was finally called in for combat. The number of F-82s in Korea would be rather low, however, as just around 45 of them would be part of the Far East Air Forces that flew in Korea. The rest of them would either be scattered about various American air bases as part of the Strategic Air Command, or would be up north in Alaska as part of the Alaskan Air Command. Still, despite the low numbers in Korea, the F-82 would cement its place in history as the plane would score the United States' first confirmed aerial kill of the Korean War on June 27, 1950. 
while escorting C-54 transport planes, three different F-82s would score kills against Russian-made North Korean aircraft, taking down a Yak-11 and two LA-7s. This historic moment would effectively be the peak of the F-82's dogfighting career, however, as past this point, it would mainly serve as a ground attacker to decent success. For air-to-air -air combat, the U.S. already had one of their earliest jet fighters, the F-80 Shooting Star, which was admittedly inferior to Soviet jet fighters at the time, but I digress. In this ground attacker role, the F-82 would use its 650 caliber machine guns, its bombs, and its rockets to great effect. While being effective in this role, the march of technology and general attrition would see F-82s slowly fade from the battlefield. As the production of the F-82 ended back in 1948, there weren't any new planes or spare parts for it being sent over. So whatever F-82s they had had to be kept functioning by ripping parts from other F-82s. This basically meant that the F-82s would slowly waste away in Korea with no actual way of replacing them. Speaking of, as for actually replacing them, by around mid-1950, the F-94 Starfire jet interceptor would be officially introduced, and by March 1951, the F-94 would first arrive in Korea. This would start the gradual process that would eventually lead to the F-82 being phased out by the end of the war. Additionally, in its original escort role, the F-82 had already been replaced by the F-84 Thunderjet, introduced in 1947 and arriving in Korea in November 1950. So, with the F-82 now fully replaced by jet fighters in Korea, the remaining F-82s were either shipped up to Alaska, where they would sit around in hangars unused, or they would be placed into storage at Robbins Air Force Base in Georgia. By November 1953, general attrition would reduce the number of in-service F-82s down to just one, and that month on November 12th, it would be officially retired. Of the original 272 F-82s made, just five of them still exist. One of them is currently in good enough condition to fly, three of them are on display at various museums, and the final one is being restored so it can fly once more. As one final point, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the record that the F-82 set. On February 27, 1947, an F-82 named Betty Jo would fly the longest non-stop flight ever made by a propeller-driven plane, flying 5,051 miles, aided by the use of three external fuel tanks. This flight would take 14 hours and 32 minutes, and to this day, that record still stands. The Betty Jo is actually one of the few surviving aircraft, currently on display at the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Ohio. So, to wrap up here, I think we can safely say that the F-82 was placed in a rather odd predicament. Arriving just as the jet era was beginning, it was already outdated and really didn't have a place in the Air Force. However, because of production issues, it would be forced into combat and would serve for a short period of time, and performed rather admirably. However, it could only ever be a stopgap due to its general technological outdatedness. Regardless, the F-82 is an interesting blip in aviation history, being the effective end of propeller-driven fighters for the United States Air Force. It was the last step towards the modern age of jet fighters, so I think it deserves recognition for that alone. Excluding that, though, I think the plane just looks pretty cool. Alright, and with that, I think we'll go ahead and end for today. Thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. I referenced the F-82 at the end of last video, and the more I looked into it, the more I wanted to talk about it, so I decided I would. And I did. But I'm done now. So, I hope you liked the video, I hope you watch my next one, and I hope you learned something from this one. So, see ya!